Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, we are ever reliant on your kindness and your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray this morning as we gather together as a body, Lord, that you would be present. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd humble our hearts. Um, whatever pride or self-reliance we bring into this room this morning, I pray that you would rip it from us and replace it with trust and worship of you. Be with us as we endeavor to know you better and to follow you more faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Daniel said, we are going to be back in the book of Luke. Um, I'm excited to be with you this morning. I haven't preached in like nine months, so I'm super pumped. Um, I grew up... As I said, my name is Stephen. I grew up loving sports. I played a bunch of sports, but I loved basketball. I couldn't get enough of it as a kid um, and even as an adult. But I have been married for 12 years, and I have two young children, which means I don't get to play basketball very much anymore. Um, And as a father, as your kids start to grow up, it's only right that you want the best for your kids, right? And the best for my kids is to love basketball, to love the things that I love. My oldest is four years old. Um, She's about the age that I had hoped she would start to love doing the things that I love, playing catch, kicking a soccer ball around, and shooting hoops. We have this little Fisher-Price basketball hoop for her in her room, and we hung it up like a year ago, and since, she has had literally zero interest in putting the ball in the hoop. Much to my dismay, zero interest. But I knew, as her father, and who she takes after, exactly what she needed to want to put the ball in the hoop. See, I am fiercely competitive. There is nary a human with the amount of pride in their soul that I have that needs to win. And so I knew how to stoke the fire of love for basketball in my daughter. So one morning, or it was an afternoon after school, I believe we were playing in her room, and I grabbed the ball, and I grabbed it, and I said, Harper, if I make this, I win and you lose. So I grabbed it and put it in, and I pointed at her, And I said, you lose, and I win. And her face went from like, who cares, to like, let's go. (laughs) She felt it. She felt that competitive spirit that I feel. She didn't care about the rules. She didn't care about even the goal. Two minutes in, all she was doing was spear tackling me anytime I got the ball in my hands. She was doing anything in her power to get the ball from me and into the hoop. Flying spear tackles became her signature move. Unfortunately, She carried that signature move over to the next time she played soccer with her little cousins. (laughs) Anytime, now I have a daughter that anytime she's playing a sport, something competitive, she is a linebacker in the NFL, spear tackling kids to the ground. It's not quite that dramatic. The point is, Harper does not understand how the game is played. She doesn't get the rules or the strategy or really even the point. She wants to just tackle and win, whatever that means. With reckless abandon, she just goes. So it is sometimes with Christians trying to follow Jesus and be his disciples. In our text this morning, we're going to get a picture of who Jesus really is. We're going to see why he came and took on flesh. And we're going to see why it's important to truly know Jesus if we're going to follow him faithfully. Just as you have to know the game of basketball to play the game of basketball, we need to know Jesus in order to follow him faithfully. We are back in the book of Luke. As Daniel read, we took a brief hiatus for about five weeks. We resume our series walking through this gospel. To refresh our memories, Tyler left us with a series of events in Luke 9. We began looking at what it, actually, what it looks like practically to be a disciple of Jesus, to follow Jesus as, as his disciple. And the window we get is through the eyes of the disciples, through the experience of the disciples, the 12 disciples that followed Jesus on earth. So to put it simply, we're in a section looking at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. If you've been around Sovereign Hope for a little while, even a short while, you know that we love discipleship. Um, By that, we simply mean helping one another to follow Jesus in all of life through the gospel. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, follow me as I follow Christ. The life of a Christian is one of discipleship, following Jesus and then teaching others to do the same, training others in what it looks like to faithfully follow Jesus. This inertia of discipleship is important to us as a church, as Christians, because it is important to Jesus. It's the way that he chose for the church to continue the ministry of the gospel when he left. And this morning, we're going to look at three episodes. Really, it's two episodes with a little aside at the end. 
We're going to look at three little episodes that point to the varied reality of Jesus' identity and his mission that shape for us who it is we follow, so then what that discipleship looks like. After all, how could we follow someone, strive to be like them, emulate and honor them if we don't really know them or understand them? So this morning, our our broad point is this, to follow Jesus faithfully means seeing Jesus rightly. That's our effort this morning through the middle of chapter 9 in Luke. We want to understand who Jesus is so that we may follow him more faithfully and in greater obedience. We're going to see three aspects of Jesus' identity in this section of Scripture. One, we're going to see the glory of God in Jesus. Two, we're going to see the compassionate authority of Jesus. And three, we are going to see the gospel mission of Jesus. The glory of God in Jesus, the compassionate authority of Jesus, and the gospel mission of Jesus. Three aspects of who Jesus is, none of which we can neglect if we want to be his disciples and disciple others. Let's start in Luke 9, verses 28 and 29. Luke says this, Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became a dazzling white. So this event, this event follows a moment Jesus had with the twelve where he actually foretells his death and tells them what it's going to be like to follow him, namely the cost of following him, the suffering, the sacrifice, the challenge of following Jesus in a world where sin reigns. He told them of his death and how they would suffer as well in following him. They then go to this mountain to pray, and as he's praying, something incredible happens, and this is our first point this morning, the glory of God in Jesus. So this event where three of his disciples are present, Peter, James, and John, is what we know as the transfiguration of Jesus. In your Bible, there's a little title that probably says that, where the essence of Jesus' glory began to shine through him to a degree visible to those with him. His face shimmering, garment shining, a bright white. Now, the word white here is actually really specific. Lucos. It shows up 25 times in the New Testament. 16 of those are in one book, Revelation. The revelation that that John received from God. This white is the purest shade of white imaginable. So pure that to accurately capture that white is to receive a revelation from God. We can't really grasp it in our finiteness. This white represents perfect, unvarnished, glorious holiness. I read one pastor call it the grand apocalyptic color. So what is shining through Jesus at this moment on this mountain is the purest essence of Jesus's godness. What the disciples will witness in this incarnation the physical manifestation of his glory. This is not a glory placed upon him, a mask that descends, that he receives from above. This is a radiant glory from Jesus' very essence that shines from him. All of that to say, Jesus in his glory on that mountaintop, this is a stunning show to the disciples that this meek, humble, gentle carpenter that they have been following does not capture the essence of Jesus' identity. See, Jesus and his disciples aren't alone on that mountain. In this literally glorious moment, look at 30 and 31 with me, picking up the event. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which was he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Moses and Elijah joined him, also appearing in glory. And they spoke with Jesus. You have Moses who received the law of God, representing the law, and then you have Elijah representing the prophets. You have the whole economy of the Old Testament here with Jesus, the law, the prophets, and Jesus, the fulfillment. Further, both of these men, Elijah and Moses, had their own encounters with the glory of God while they were on earth. Moses, on the mountain, the glory of God actually passed before Moses to the degree where he had to close his eyes lest he be blinded. Elijah, in a cave, received the glory of God as well, was taken up. Elijah didn't die. He was taken up in the glory of God into heaven. Both of these men had a previous 
exposure to the glory of God, and now get this moment where they see the glory of God manifest in the Savior. We saw both of these men as well previously in chapter 9. Look, look with me at 7 and 8 and 18 and 19. Chapter 9, verses 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had arisen. This is Herod, confused at who Jesus is. He's doing all these amazing things. Who is this Jesus? And look at 16 through, or rather 18 through 19 with me. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets of old, has arisen. Luke is hammering home this point that Jesus is distinct. Jesus doesn't come as only a representation of the old law, as a fulfillment of only the law. He doesn't come as a representation of the voice of God, as a prophet, as the word of God. But he comes as the Messiah, Savior, who fulfills both. Peter, James, and John got to witness this moment. Kind of. Look with me at 32 and 33. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. So perhaps foreshadowing what these men would actually themselves do in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is also praying, they fall asleep. <laughs> what a moment to fall asleep, right? Moses and Elijah show up in glory. Jesus is shining with the very essence of the glory of God, and they're napping. <laughs> I think we can assume that they've been praying for a while. That why they went up to the mountain in the first place was to pray. So they fell asleep praying, only to wake up to the shining face of Jesus in conversation with two of their most revered patriarchs. And so as Moses and Elijah, they begin to leave Peter, not wanting this moment to end, offers to make a tent for each of them. Other translations for that word tent use actually use tabernacle. Peter offers to make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. See, Peter is doing the very same thing that we saw the people and Herod doing earlier. When the people couldn't decide if Jesus was Elijah or Jesus was a prophet or Jesus was John the Baptist... Peter offers to place a, make a place of honor for all three of them, equal honor for all three of them. Not seeing the lack of distinction he makes between Jesus and what he fulfills. Ultimately, he's not honoring Jesus enough. He's not honoring Jesus as the radiant, glorious son of God, the second member of the triune Godhead. Look at 34 and 35. 34 through 36. So as he was saying these things, Peter, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. See, perhaps in a response to Peter's blunder, a cloud, a fog over tapes takes them. And the fact they're afraid probably means this cloud, this fog happened really, really suddenly. They didn't see it coming. And amidst this cloud comes the booming voice of the Father God, my chosen one, my son. The voice of God making abundantly clear the distinctive godness of Jesus. I think it can be tempting sometimes, easy for us, to think about Jesus almost exclusively as the meek, gentle carpenter that sat kindly with the woman at the well or wept at the deathbed of Lazarus. These are not inaccurate pictures of Jesus. Jesus has an abundance of kindness and mercy and gentleness. Soon we're going to see his care as he heals a young boy. We just came out of a series about emotions and dealing with anxiety and depression and anger and suffering where it's imperative that we see Jesus as not only the one who heals, but who empathizes with us in our weakness as he himself was subject to the weaknesses of the flesh. However, we must not forget, Jesus is God, the great I am. You see, Jesus was weak. 
for a short period of time while he was the incarnate God. Jesus now is in glory at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, who in eternity past has existed in perfect relationship, perfect, glorious, uncomprehendable existence with God, and is going to return in that same glorious white as he makes all things new. Peter, James, and John kind of missed it. They fell asleep at the initial moment of his glory shining through. And as both the prophets arrived, waking up mid-conversation, they also missed, as represented by Peter, after seeing the radiance of Jesus' manifest glory, still thought of him at the same level with their patriarchs, at the same level as their prophets. A wonderful rabbi, a good teacher, a great healer. You see, if we lose the glorious godness of Jesus, we cannot follow him as we ought. We cannot be his disciples. Jesus is the sovereign, perfect, ruling judge of the universe. And as we saw, he is the chosen one, the son of God. Hebrews 1 says that in him the father chose to manifest his glory there are many implications of this has for our discipleship and how we follow Jesus and how we help others follow Jesus. This means that everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did during his ministry on earth holds the same promissory weight of all the covenants, of all the promises that God made throughout history with his people. In other words, Jesus' promises hold true. Everything Jesus says, everything Jesus promises is true. When he told us a couple of weeks ago, when we were in chapter 9, that we were going to suffer for his sake, we have to take up a cross and follow him. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. That we will suffer, but it will all be made. It will all be worth its weight, not in gold, but in glory. He guaranteed that to his people. Far more real are these promises to hold on to when spoken with the weight of God's glory behind them. Even think about our talking to yourself series, talking about anxiety, depression, and anger. It's important that we see the caring nature of Jesus, but before that, again, Jesus is God. If that's the case, then how much more real does Jesus' empathy carry when he, when the glorious Jesus willingly subjected himself to the frailty of those same temptations to anxiety? those same temptations to anger and depression. What a hope so much more tangible when Jesus himself, God, subjected himself to those struggles. What a future more assured. See, to follow Jesus rightly, we must see Jesus for who he is, our glorious reigning king. The gravity of our discipleship can only make sense if who we are following is worth it. In the transfiguration, there is no mistaking at the very core of Jesus' identity. In his glory, he is worth it. Picking up our story in verse 37, Luke says this, On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out, it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Here we see the next event in our text this morning. The day following the transfiguration, Jesus and those three have rejoined the rest of the disciples along with a crowd, and Jesus heals a young boy possessed by a demon. This is where we get our second point this morning, the compassionate authority of Jesus. So as the crowd presses in, a man with a son is distraught, starts begging Jesus to heal his only son. He hurriedly describes the symptoms and laments that even Jesus' disciples couldn't heal him. They couldn't deal with what was going on with the boy and the demon. And Jesus, despite the lack of faith, the faithlessness, as he says, heals the boy. See, sometimes we can read scripture, particularly 
stories like this, where there's supernatural things happening, and we layer onto it our own understanding of modern, postmodern worldview. And so what we read here, when we layer on our own worldview, is not really a demon possessing a boy, but a medical issue. Right? It's, a, it's a seizure, which we would call epilepsy. And this is what the author of the Gospels didn't really understand. They didn't understand modern medicine, but if they had, they would have called this epilepsy, not a demon possessing a little boy. But just like the transfiguration, all three of our texts tonight show up in two of the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark. The thing is, there was an understanding of epilepsy at the time of Jesus. There was an understanding of what's the medical problem of seizures at the time of Jesus. Turn back to Matthew 4, where this account happens, and Matthew records it, verse 24. Um, never mind, that's the next part of my, I skipped ahead. In Matthew 17, where Jesus is doing the, this, this event with the boy, where he's healing the boy, Matthew actually calls it seizures, and some translations actually call it epilepsy. Now going to Matthew verse 4, 24, sorry about that. He says, this is talking about Jesus. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, and paralytics, and he healed them. Even in Matthew, even at the time of Jesus, even in these gospels, there is a distinction between those possessed by demons and those with seizures. Again, other translations literally use the word epilepsy in Matthew 4, verse 24. See, what's happening here is not a medical issue. It's not a broken brain. Remember, Luke, the author of this book, is a doctor himself. If anyone around Jesus, if anyone around his disciples was going to make a distinction between something supernatural and something medical, it was going to be Luke, Dr. Luke. It was going to be the doctor among them. Luke is making the point, this is a particularly spiritual sickness. Something at work within the boy that defies our understanding, that defies medical care. Something that only spiritual authority could answer namely the authority of Jesus. It's funny to me sometimes how Jesus heals people in the Gospels, um, and this is a great example. You have these crowds pressing in, returning from this glorious event on the mountaintop, just, uh, just big word after big word, the father laboring to describe the evil that is oppressing his son in vivid detail, the harm and suffering that he endures, the failure of Jesus' disciples to help a demon possessing a young boy the incomprehensible problem that no one could possibly have an answer for. All of this build up only for a sentence from Luke. Not even a whole verse, half a verse. Luke 9, verse 42. When he was coming, the demon threw himself to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to the father. See, the matter of fact way in which Jesus deals with the undealable, the incomprehensible, proving again and again the cosmic gulf between the most incomprehensible, horrible things we can possibly think of or experience and the kind mercy of God, the power of the authority of Jesus. It's even the simple way in Luke, the simple way that Luke describes the event that points so clearly to Jesus' just unmitigated, unfettered authority over all things, even things we don't like to talk about, like demons. It's an authority that actually flows from his glory, coming down from the mountain. Only the Son of God, the chosen one, could have that kind of authority. See, authority like this is compelling, but even more compelling is when it's coupled with the compassionate care that we see so often in Jesus in the gospel accounts as he heals people. Take this story. There's a reason the men went to the disciples themselves for help first, or the man went to the disciples first. Again, look back at Luke 9 earlier on. Starting in verse 1, and he called the 12 together, it's Jesus calling the 12 disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Skip down to verse 6. And they departed, that's the disciples, and went throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Not only did Jesus commission his disciples 
to go and do the very kinds of healing he was doing, to offer the very kinds of help and hope that he was offering, but they were even successful to a degree. But what's different about this man? What's different about this moment? Well, we, we get a picture. Verse 41, Jesus answered a faithless and twisted generation. How long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. Jesus' seeming exasperation is at their lack of faith. The lack of belief in his authority. The same authority that he had given to his disciples previously. And he laments not just his disciples, but everyone around him. That's why he says faithless and twisted disciples. No, he says, faithless and twisted generation, meaning all of these people didn't really believe that Jesus could deal with this incomprehensible problem. When we compare this to the account of events in the Gospel of Mark, we get an even clearer picture of this faithlessness. Look at Mark chapter 9, verses 21 to 23. It says this, And Jesus asked the Father, How long has this been happening to him? And he, said from, and he said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. The compassion of Jesus is not seen simply in healing the boy, which it is compassion. The compassion of Jesus is seen in healing the boy despite the lack of faith. What we learn about Jesus from this event is his compassionate authority. If you read through any of the gospels, you'll see Jesus healing and helping people in need over and over and over again. Jesus' word and will changing and shifting the natural course of the world power over waves and wind and storms, power over demons and spiritual things we could scarcely comprehend. And uniquely, Jesus didn't always require faith to heal or casting out of demons. It's not actually often that Jesus calls someone to faith before he heals them. But here, this story, coupled with what Peter, James, and John witnessed, is Jesus showing his disciples what he is capable of through faithful disciples. See, through this man and his son, Jesus demonstrates how he will use even a minute faith to do incredible things for the kingdom of God. This foreshadows the mission of God in the Christian, the mission of God in the church. The point is this, as disciples and disciplers, we must understand the compassionate authority of Jesus because it is faith in the compassionate, authoritative Jesus that has the power to change us, to shape us. In all of our effort to follow Jesus, it isn't our effort that bears fruit. It isn't our will or our hard work. In all of our efforts to help others follow Jesus, it is not winsome speech or clever one-liners that change minds and shape our obedience. The only way we change and grow is through faith. The only way we change is through faith. God himself works in us to change us. And we know that he will, not because he says he will in 1 Thessalonians 5, but because we know who Jesus is and what he is like and what he gave his disciples the responsibility to do. We know Jesus will change us because we know Jesus. See, discipleship will be a tough and hard ground if we are reliant on ourselves and not on Jesus. If we see Jesus if we don't see Jesus as the one who owns that authority, has dominion and rule over the things that we understand and the things that we don't, then it is likely our maturity will begin to flatline and so will those that we endeavor to help. Let's pick our rest of our event, verse 43 of chapter nine. And all were astonished at the majesty of God, but while they were marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it and were afraid to ask him about the saying. Immediately after the events of this demon-possessed boy, Jesus pulls his disciples aside and delivers to them something very important. 
We know it's important because it says, lend your ears. Let it sink into you. It's the second time in this chapter and the second time in the book of Luke that Jesus predicts his death to his disciples. And this is the third aspect of Jesus' identity that we are after this morning. It's the gospel mission of Jesus. You see, the reason, the, the reason that Jesus entered into this earth, that the incarnate Jesus took on flesh was to die a sinner's death on a cross, though he himself would know not sin, though he himself would not earn that death. See, it's as if Jesus is pulling them back to reality, these disciples, back to the point and purpose of his coming in the first place. You see, this glorious moment on a mountain, this incredible healing, this compassion and authority of Jesus, people in awe, and he reminds them of his ultimate goal, to die, to die for the sin of mankind and to reconcile the sinner back to God. If you were closely reading earlier in our text, you will have seen the reference to this already. When Jesus was on the mountain talking to Elijah and Moses, look at verse, chapter 9, verse 29 through 31. This is as he's on the mountain, and he, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. It's interesting that in Jesus' his most physically glorious moment, the physical manifestation of his glory, he still got eyes for the cross. He still got eyes pointing towards his death. He wants to keep pressing towards the moment of his death and suffering, his mission. It explains why in the midst of adoration, right, verse 43, and all were astonished at the majesty of God as he casts out this demon, it explains why Jesus steps aside with his disciples and warns them, this is not how it's always going to be. This is not what it's always going to be like. Those that marvel will soon turn on him and demand that he be crucified and put to death. The gospel mission of Jesus is at the center of everything we do as a church because the gospel mission of Jesus was at the center of everything Jesus was doing in his incarnation even in the highest, most glorious moments. It includes the moment on the mountaintop, every moment of healing and casting out of spiritual darkness. That's why Jesus warns his disciples that these people's reverence would soon turn to rage because Jesus' mission was his, in, Jesus mission in his incarnation was his death and resurrection. See, as a church, we use the phrase gospel-centered very often. See, all of our sermons, all of our teaching, all of our discipleship must at their core be tethered to the gospel mission of Jesus. A good definition we have here at the church is just this Jesus doing everything required to restore broken sinners back to God, which was dying on a cross, rising from death to life, ascending bodily to the right hand of the Father and, and imparting to us, Christians, his people, the Holy Spirit of God, to empower us with all authority and compassion that Jesus had. See, in order to follow Jesus rightly, to be his disciple, the gospel must be the source and the end of everything we aim to do. Two practical applications from the mission of Jesus See, being a disciple of Jesus means holding tightly to the gospel in two ways. The gospel is our beginning and the gospel as our end. The gospel is the beginning. In many ways, the gospel is our beginning. It is the gospel of Jesus that saves us from our sin and unbelief. Ephesians 2, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If you are a Christian in here, you were saved by the choosing grace of God. You were dead. <laughs> Dead people aren't known for their great acts of heroism or clarity. Yet in our dead souls, we were brought back into relationship with God, back into the relationship with the God of the universe by the atoning work of Jesus, propitiating for our sin, taking the wrath that our rebellion deserved. You see, if we lose the gospel, we lose what saves us. That's that which brings us to life. But then beyond salvation and conversion, the gospel is the beginning of our goodness, walking in good works. How do we know what compassion looks like? Because compassion was perfected as Jesus died, paying for our sin that we might no longer suffer in our sin. He saw our suffering and died for it. Compassion, 
perfected. How do we know what humility is? Philippians 2, because humility was perfected in Jesus, existing in perfect glory, taking on weak human flesh. To also go die. We have a picture of perfect humility. How do we know what love is? 1 John 4, because he, the Father, loved us and sent his Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. All our efforts at goodness, love, compassion, humility, kindness, gentleness, are downstream of our understanding of the gospel of Jesus. See, if we lose the gospel, we lose the ideal to strive for in all of our goodness. We lose our anchor. See, any other ideal is made from broken, fallen, human, finite flesh. Maybe we start to define for ourselves what love is, what kindness is, what compassion is. Maybe my definition begins to look a little bit different than yours does. Before you know it, we start defining our love by our political affiliations or our activism, how much money we give, or how loud we are on social media about the causes that we care about. All of our goodness, any act of kindness, compassion, mercy, it's all better when done as a representation of what God did through Jesus in the gospel. Any other source of our goodness, any other motivation or drive for goodness is a cheap knockoff. Finally, the gospel is also the beginning of our discipleship, our helping others follow Jesus, because it was Jesus who called 12 men to himself that he would impart authority to, who would give responsibility of continuing his ministry to. Part of Jesus' mission on earth was to not leave without preparing others to carry on the ministry of mercy in the gospel and the message of salvation in the gospel. See, helping others follow Jesus means helping others begin with the gospel. Losing the gospel in our discipleship means losing discipleship. To be redundant, if we are following Jesus, then what's important to Jesus must be important to us. If we are emphasizing something other than what Jesus emphasized, are we really following Jesus anymore? The second, so the gospel is our beginning, now the gospel is our goal. Just like the gospel is the beginning of the life of the Christian at conversion, the gospel should be our aim at the end. The result of the gospel is being reconciled back to God. Jesus did everything required to reconcile broken sinners back to God. He says, Adam and Eve walked in the garden with the Lord. In heaven, we will walk with him, reconciled to him. What else could we possibly look forward to that is more compelling? What could we possibly look forward to if we lose that? The gospel is also the end of our goodness. We aren't good for goodness sake. Jesus isn't Santa Claus. Our goodness should ultimately point towards the gospel of Jesus. All the ways we are loving, kind, gentle, merciful, generous, humble, shouldn't lead to praise for us in our efforts. Rather, they should be clear waypoints on the path to gospel proclamation. If we don't end with the gospel and our doing of good, then doing of good becomes a moralistic, vain exercise in self-exaltation. And then in our discipleship, the gospel is the end. We and those we disciple should live in holiness and goodness because of the gospel, as well as so that the gospel might be proclaimed in our lives. And if we lose the gospel as our goal in discipleship, it will cease to be follow me as I follow Jesus. It will just simply be follow me. All in all, the gospel is what is pushing us and pulling us towards Jesus. So in closing, I just want to ask, do you see Jesus clearly? Is there an aspect of Jesus' identity that you've neglected or even ignored? See, if we, call, if we want to call ourselves Christians, we want to claim to follow Jesus as his people, then we must see him as he is. Let us not neglect the reality of our Savior, but press to know him more. And in anything we do, may sovereign hope be marked by carrying on the mission of Jesus that is threaded throughout this entire text. That is the gospel of salvation to all who sin. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we are uh, we're weak. No one would argue that we are finite or that we are imperfect. Lord, I pray that as we read this, this high and this low of Jesus, that I pray that as we learn more about you, as we learn to see you more clearly, that we would become more reliant on you. And that in any way we are tempted to trust ourselves or trust something other than you. Lord Jesus, convict us of our unbelief as the father of this boy. Help us to know you more deeply so that we might follow you more faithfully. Help us to know you more deeply so that we might help others follow you more faithfully. Lord, let our mission be your mission. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.